Exercise 18 deals with cardiovascular physiology. And here we're going to be looking at the cardiac cycle, which is that period of time that it takes. It's going to start when the atriums contract, and it will end when the ventricles relax. So it's that time period, atriums contract, relax, ventricles contract, and then relax. That whole time period is the cardiac cycle. Systolic refers to contraction, diastolic refers to relaxation. Um, blood tends to flow down a pressure gradient, meaning it's going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. It's just naturally the way things want to, to move. So when we look at the cardiac cycle, initially all the chambers are relaxed. At that point, when all four chambers are relaxed, your AV valves are going to be open. The semilunar valves are closed, so that means blood can easily flow from the atrium down to the ventricles, but it cannot leave the ventricles because the semilunar valves are closed. Then the atria are going to contract. When you compare this, and we're going to be looking at the cardiac cycle in terms of when the chambers are contracting, when they're relaxing, correlate that to when the various valves are open versus being closed, and then compare all that also at the same time if you look at um, an EKG valve to, and see what the different peaks and valleys mean. So when the atriums contract, that's what on an EKG you look at is the P wave. Then the atriums are going to relax. When they relax, the AV valves close, the ventricles are going to contract. And when the ventricles contract, so your AV valves are closed, now the semilunar valves open. It has to do with the pressure difference. They're going to open so the blood, as the ventricles contract now, are pushing the blood out of the ventricles. And they're moving through those semilunar valves, either through the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. Relative to an EKG, this is what is known as the QRS complex. And we're going to look at an EKG graph in just a moment. There's a picture that kind of puts all of this together. When the ventricles then relax, this is referred to as the T wave. And at this point, the semilunar valves close. And now the AV valves are going to open. And so when we talk about the cardiac cycle, what is happening is you are going through these steps in this order, and then it's just going to cycle back around, which is why we call it the cardiac cycle. Now, to put all of this together visually, uh, this may help some of you to see <coughs> that uh, when we talk, look at an EKG graph, and up here, Right here is the P wave. And so that's at the very beginning. You can see what is happening. Remember, uh, you're looking at relaxation versus contraction. You're going through what is happening here. Over on this side, you've got the QRS complex. And then down here is the T wave. So here's the P wave. Here is the QRS complex, and here is the T wave. We know under normal conditions what these should look like relative what they should, the spacing between them, how the peak should look, etc. And so on, there are several different diagrams showing this in different aspects. So one picture may make sense to you, but not another. Find the one that makes sense to you for this. So on this one, as you can see, you are starting way up here for this, the cardiac cycle. And just follow the arrows around. You can see where the valves are closed versus being open. Here's the P wave. So now you see the AV valves right here have opened. So blood flow is coming down from the atrium into the ventricles. Then as they contract, you're towards the end of the P wave here. You're setting this. This is showing um, the pathway here, the electrical conduction, um, that impulse that's triggering the contraction of the heart. So now, over here, you are now moving into the final stages with the T. And so you can notice where the valves are opening and closing. Another way of showing that is here. Um, 
so to have the inter and this is basically showing what is known as the conduction center. Your SA node or your uh, sinoatrial node, this is the pacemaker cells. And what is going to happen, um, they start, they're specialized with the, to produce an electrical current. They're going to come down here, trigger the, uh, or stimulate the AV node or the atrial ventricular node, which then, as you, so, you start here, move down here. There's a slight little delay. This is going to trigger the two atriums to contract. And then there's a slight little delay here until it moves down here to eventually your Purkinje fibers. And they send the electrical impulse this way to trigger then your ventricles to contract. There's a slight delay there so that your atriums contract, ventricles contract, atria, ventricle, atria, ventricle in there. And as you can see at the bottom, this is all correlated to your uh, EKG graph as well. And so on this one, it is showing uh, atriums versus ventricles and showing that one whole cardiac cycle of the P, the QRS complex, and then the T ring. This is something that with practice and experience, especially if you're working on a cardiac floor, you will learn to be able to just look at an EKG printout oftentimes and be like, oh, this looks normal, or no, this does not. Uh, there's a problem here. And kind of, it, it's something you gain with experience. In terms of the heart sounds, it's often described when you're listening through the stethoscope of a, a lub dub, bum, 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 bum. That first sound, that's the closing of the AV valves. And that's as the AV valves close, that's when the ventricles are contracting. The second sound is the closing of the semilunar valves. A heart murmur. This is a sound that really should not be there. And it's usually due to valve defects. Um, some people have a significant heart murmur. Oftentimes, as you get older, um, it's not that uncommon as a part of the aging process is to develop a slight murmur. Um, just kind of FYI, part of the aging process because it becomes a little bit more common. Um, just keep an eye on it if that happens. Um, because the heart murmur has to do with the heart, the valves, um, there's some defect. It, it's oftentimes it's not closing properly, and so you can hear the, the blood rushing through there. That's what gives the murmur sound. Just come kind of an FYI, if you do have a heart murmur, one thing they often do recommend is that prior to uh, having any procedure done, number one, to get the okay from a cardiologist that you're okay for the surgery. But even for small things like having any dental work done, um, is to possibly to have a preventative antibiotic that you take because you don't want to, if you're doing even just dental cleaning or they're cleaning around the gums, possibility of bleeding, you don't want to take risk of getting an infection in the blood that can travel to the valves, which are already not functioning properly and get some severe infection there. Um, so it's just something to be, to be aware of. Um, I know personally for me years ago I was diagnosed with a slight heart murmur and so before I go to the dentist, I my dentist now prescribes I have to take an antibiotic an hour before I go see him just for regular um, cleanup and checkups just as a preventative thing. You look at the heart rate, uh, newborn's heart rate is higher and it tends to decrease as you are growing your child. And then it is, we kind of cycle back, it increases again as you get older. In an adult, a resting adult, average heart rate is typically between 1600 beats per minute. Now, if you are an athlete, especially like a professional athlete, very serious athlete, Typically, your resting heart rate may be a little bit lower than 60. Uh, bradycardia is a low heart rate where it's less than 60. Tachycardia is where it's, it's too high. It's greater than 100 beats per minute under just resting conditions. It's good to know what your resting heart rate is. Pulse, this indicates what the heart rate is. Where do you take the pulse? 
Number one, when you go to take a pulse, never use your thumb because you're going to pick up yours, not the patient. Um, probably most people are familiar with taking the pulse here on the, the radial artery but or the carotid right here. But there are other locations where you can um, also take it. In terms of blood flow, that's the movement of the blood through the blood vessels. Resistance is going to slow down that blood flow a bit. Blood pressure is what's the force um, that the blood is putting on the, the, the heart chambers, or on the walls of the blood vessels. Usually you will measure blood pressure in the brachial artery. Now, when you are measuring the pressure, systolic pressure, that's the top number. Uh, diastolic is the bottom number on there. Generally speaking, average blood pressure typically is, they used to always say 120 over 80, sometimes 110 over 70, kind of in that, that range. <coughs> um, you can take those numbers and do a couple of other calculations such as pulse pressure or mean arterial pressure. As we have discussed previously, the pressure is going to be greatest in your arteries. The aorta has the highest blood pressure of any of your arteries and then it decreases and in the veins it's the lowest pressure. Um, just FYI, just a little kind of bits of information here. If somebody has an injury and it is, um, the blood is just flowing out without pulsing, it's from a vein. If it's pulsing, like squirting, stop, squirt, stop, that's an artery then that has, um, it has to do with the pressure. When you draw blood, you are it's called a vena puncture. You are uh, drawing or removing that blood from a vein. Um, and part of the reason for that is because the pressure is much lower. There are certain situations where you may have to draw from an artery that's much harder to do because of the pressure. It takes some experience to do that. To measure blood pressure, you use a stethoscope and your sphygmanometer, which is what one of those people would just refer to it as your blood pressure cuff because it's easier to say. That first sound, when you pump up the cuff and you are listening and you are looking at the stethoscope, so, or using the stethoscope and you're looking at your dial on your, your blood pressure cuff, you notice when the first time you hear a sound, notice that number and that's going to be your systolic pressure. And you're going to hear, so initially as you start to uh, release the pressure, you're listening with your stethoscope, you don't hear anything and all of a sudden you start to hear the Bum, 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 You have to be paying attention. That first sound, that, notice the number. And then when you hear the very last sound, that's your diastolic pressure. So the first sound systolic, second sound, or the last sound is going to be the diastolic on there. And so this is just showing as you are hearing it, um, some people initially when they're trying to learn how to take blood pressure forget to look at the dial to record the number. They're so intent on listening for the sound and it's like well, you need that number. Something else just to keep in mind, uh, for years some people used to ignore the fact of what was known as white coat syndrome. This has been validated. There are some people who get very nervous just by seeing someone walk in with a white lab coat on and their blood pressure is going to go up. Um, this was interesting for me. I had a neighbor years ago who had high blood pressure and was on medication and trying to monitor it and was monitoring at home and her doctor didn't always believe her initially that when she monitored it at home it was lower than when she was in the doctor's office. So she finally asked me if I could help monitor for her and we were recording it for her, her doctor. And then when she went in, her doctor once again kind of questioned that yes, it was high, but it was much, much higher at the doctor's office. And I had told her, I said, I think you have white coat syndrome. So one day when she was over visiting and I took her blood pressure 
she was taking her medication, so it was fine. And we were visiting, and like I said, it was fine. And after a while, I was like, I'll be right back. And I went in the back, and I came out with my lab coat on. She was not used to seeing me with my lab coat on. I came out with my lab coat on, and I took her blood pressure again. And it was high. And she was visibly looking nervous. She says, why do you have that lab coat on? I, I, I like you, but I don't like you with the lab coat on. You're making me nervous. We were still, I took the lab coat off. We were still visiting for quite a while, doing something. And then later I went and I took her blood pressure a third time. And it was back down again. And it's like, you definitely have white coat syndrome. She would be fine if I took it without my lab coat. If she even saw my lab coat sitting on a chair, she would get nervous. So they have recognized that there are some people that it just makes them very nervous. So just kind of keep that in mind. 